The Storm of Doubt My reading of heretical and broad church works on one side, and of orthodox ones on the other, now occupied a large part of my time, and our removal to Sibsey in Lincolnshire, an agricultural village with a scattered population, increased my leisure. I read the works of Robertson, Stopford Brooke, Stanley, Gregg, Matthew Arnold, Lydon, Mansell, and many another, and my skepticism grew deeper and deeper as I read. The broad church arguments appeared to me to be of the nature of special pleading, skillful evasions of difficulties rather than the real meeting and solving of them. For the problem was, given a good God, how can he have created mankind, knowing beforehand that the vast majority of those whom he created were to be tortured forever? Given a just God, how can he punish people for being sinful, when they have inherited a sinful nature without their own choice and of necessity? Given a righteous God, how can he allow sin to exist forever, so that evil shall be as eternal as good, and Satan shall reign in hell as long as Christ in heaven? Worst of all puzzles, perhaps, was that of the existence of evil and of misery, and the racking doubt whether God could be good, and yet look on the evil and the misery of the world unmoved and untouched. It seemed so impossible to believe that a creator could be either cruel enough to be indifferent to the misery, or weak enough to be unable to stop it. The old dilemma faced me incessantly. If he can prevent it and does not, he is not good. If he wishes to prevent it and cannot, he is not almighty. I racked my brains for an answer. I searched writings of believers for a clue, but I found no way of escape. Not yet had any doubt of the existence of God crossed my mind. Mr. D. continued to write me, striving to guide me along the path which had led his own soul to contentment, but I can only find room here for two brief extracts, which will show how to himself he solved the problem. He thought me mistaken in my view, quote, of the nature of the sin and error which is supposed to grieve God. I take it that sin is an absolutely necessary factor in the production of the perfect man. It was foreseen and allowed as a means to an end, as, in fact, an education. The view of all the sin and misery in the world cannot grieve God any more than it can grieve you to see Digby fail in his first attempt to build a card castle or a rabbit hutch. All is part of the training. God looks at the ideal man to which all tends. No, Mrs. Besant, I never feel at all inclined to give up the search, or to suppose that the other side may be right. I claim no merit for it, but I have an invincible faith in the morality of God and the moral order of the world. I have no more doubt about the falsehood of the popular theology than I have about the unreality of six robbers who attacked me three nights ago in a horrid dream. I exult and rejoice in the grandeur and freedom of the little bit of truth that has been given me to see. I am told that present-day papers, by Bishop Ewing, edited, are a wonderful help, many of them, to puzzled people. I mean to get them. But I am sure you will find that the truth will, even so little as we may be able to find out, grow on you, make you free, light your path, and dispel at no distant time your painful difficulties and doubts. I should say on no account give up your reading. I think with you that you could not do without it. It will be a wonderful source of help and peace to you. For there are struggles far more fearful than those of intellectual doubt. I am keenly alive to the gathered-up sadness of which your last two pages are an expression. I was sawyer than I can say to read them. They reminded me of a long and very dark time in my own life when I thought the light never would come. Thank God it came, or I think I could not have held out much longer. But you have evidently strength to bear it now. The more dangerous time, I should fancy, has passed. You will have to mind that the fermentation leaves clear spiritual wine, and not, as too often, vinegar. I wish I could write something more helpful to you in this great matter. But as I sit in front of my large bay window and see the shadows on the grass and the sunlight on the leaves, and the soft glimmer of the rosebuds left by the storms, I can but believe that all will be very well. Trust in the Lord, wait patiently for Him. They are trite words, but He made the grass, the leaves, the rosebuds, and the sunshine, and He is the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And now the trite words have swelled into a mighty argument. Unquote. 
I found more help in theistic writers like Gray and agnostic like Arnold than I did in the broad church teachers, but these, of course, served to make return to the old faith more and more impossible. The church services were a weekly torture, but feeling as I did that I was only a doubter, I kept my doubts to myself. It was possible, I felt, that all my difficulties might be cleared up, and I had no right to shake the faith of others while in uncertainty myself. Others had doubted and had afterwards recovered their faith. For the doubter, silence was a duty. The blinded had better keep their misery to themselves. During these weary months of anxiety and torment, I found some relief from the mental strain in practical parish work, nursing the sick, trying to brighten the lot of the poor. I learned then some of the lessons as to the agricultural laborer and the land that I was able in after years to teach from the platform. The movement among the agricultural laborers, due to the energy and devotion of Joseph Arch, was beginning to be discussed in the fens, and my sympathies went strongly with the claims of the laborers, for I knew their life conditions. In one cottage I had found four generations sleeping in one room, the great-grandfather and his wife, the unmarried grandmother, the unmarried mother, the little child. Three men lodgers completed the tale of eight human beings crowded into that narrow, ill-ventilated garret. Other cottages were hovels, through the broken roofs of which poured the rain, and wherein rheumatism and ague lived with the human dwellers. How could I do aught but sympathize with any combination that aimed at the raising of these poor? But the Agricultural Laborers' Union was bitterly opposed by the farmers, and they would give no work to a union man. One example may serve for all. There was a young married man with two small children, who was sinful enough to go to a union meeting and sinful enough to talk of it on his return home. No farmer would employ him in all the district round. He tramped about vainly looking for work, grew reckless and took to drink. Visiting his cottage, consisting of one room and a lean-to, I found his wife ill with fever, a fever-stricken babe in her arms, the second child lying dead on the bed. In answer to my soft-spoken questions, yes, she was pining, starving, and there was no work. Why did she leave the dead child on the bed? Because she had no other place for it till the coffin came. And at night the unhappy, driven man the fever-stricken wife, the fever-stricken child, the dead child, all lay in the one bed. The farmers hated the union because its success meant higher wages for the men, and it never struck them that they might well pay less rent to the absent landlord and higher wage to the men who tilled their fields. They had only civil words for the burden that crushed them, hard words for the mowers of their harvests and the builders up of their ricks. They made common cause with their enemies instead of with their friends, and instead of leaguing themselves together with the laborers as forming together the true agricultural interest, they leagued themselves with the landlords against the laborers, and so made ruinous fratricidal strife instead of easy victory over the common foe. And seeing all this, I learned some useful lessons, and the political education progressed while the theological strife went on within. In the early autumn a ray of light broke the darkness. I was in London with my mother and wandered one Sunday morning into St. George's Hall, where the Reverend Charles Voisey was preaching. There, to my delight, I found, on listening to the sermon and buying some literature on sale in the anteroom, that there were people who had passed through my own difficulties and had given up the dogmas that I found so revolting. I went again on the following Sunday, and when the service was over I noticed that the outgoing stream of people were passing by Mr. and Mrs. Voisey, and that many who were evidently strangers spoke a word of thanks to him as they went on. Moved by a strong desire, after the long months of lonely striving, to speak to one who had struggled out of Christian difficulties, I said to Mr. Voisey, as I passed in my turn, I must thank you for very great help in what you said this morning. For in truth, never having yet doubted the existence of God, the teaching of Mr. Voisey that he was loving unto every man, and his tender mercy over all his works, came like a gleam of light across the stormy sea of doubt and distress on which I had so long been tossing. The next Sunday saw me again at the hall, and Mrs. Voisey gave me a cordial invitation to visit them in their Dulwich home. 
I found their theism was free from the defects that had revolted me in Christianity, and they opened up to me new views of religion. I read Theodore Parker's Discourse on Religion, Francis Newman's works, those of Miss Frances Power Cobb, and of others. The anguish of the tension relaxed. The nightmare of an almighty evil passed away. My belief in God, not yet touched, was cleared from all the dark spots that had sullied it, and I no longer doubted whether the dogmas that had shocked my conscience were true or false. I shook them off, once for all, with all their pain and horror and darkness, and felt, with joy and relief inexpressible, that they were delusions of the ignorance of man, not the revelations of a god. But there was one belief that had not been definitely challenged, but of which the rationale was gone with the orthodox dogmas now definitely renounced, the doctrine of the deity of Christ. The whole teaching of the broad church school tends, of course, to emphasize the humanity of Christ at the expense of his deity, and when eternal punishment and the substitutionary atonement had gone, there seemed no reason remaining sufficient to account for so tremendous a miracle as the incarnation of the deity. In the course of my reading, I had become familiar with the idea of avatars in Eastern creeds, and I saw that the incarnate God was put forward as a fact by all ancient religions, and thus the way was paved for challenging the especially Christian teaching when the doctrines morally repulsive were cleared away. But I shrank from the thought of placing in the crucible a doctrine so dear from all the associations of the past. There was so much that was soothing and ennobling in the idea of a union between man and God, between a perfect man and a divine life, between a human heart and an almighty strength. Jesus, as God, was interwoven with all art and all beauty in religion. To break with the deity of Jesus was to break with music, with painting, with literature. The divine babe in his mother's arms, the divine man in his passion and his triumph, the friend of man encircled with the majesty of the Godhead. Did inexorable truth demand that this ideal figure, with all its pathos, its beauty, its human love, should pass away into the pantheon of the dead gods of the past? Nor was this all. If I gave up belief in Christ as God, I must give up Christianity as creed. Once challenged the unique position of the Christ, and the name Christian seemed to me to be a hypocrisy, and this renouncement a duty binding on the upright mind. I was a clergyman's wife. What would be the effect of such a step? Hitherto mental pain alone had been the price demanded inexorably from the searcher after truth. But with the renouncing of Christ, outer warfare would be added to the inner, and who might guess the result upon my life? The struggle was keen but short. I decided to carefully review the evidence for and against the deity of Christ, with the result that that belief followed the others, and I stood, no longer Christian, face to face with a dim future in which I sensed the coming conflict. One effort I made to escape it. I appealed to Dr. Pusey, thinking that if he could not answer my questionings, no answer to them could be reasonably hoped for. I had a brief correspondence with him, but was referred only to lines of argument familiar to me, as those of Lydon in his Bampton lectures, and finally on his invitation went down to Oxford to see him. I found a short, stout gentleman, dressed in a cassock, looking like a comfortable monk, but keen eyes, steadfastly gazing straight into mine, told of the force and subtlety enshrined in the fine, impressive head. But the learned doctor took the wrong line of treatment. He probably saw I was anxious, shy, and nervous, and he treated me as a penitent going to confession and seeking the advice of a director, instead of as an inquirer struggling after truth and resolute to obtain some firm standing ground in the sea of doubt. He would not deal with the question of the deity of Jesus as a question for argument. You are speaking of your judge, he retorted sternly, when I pressed a difficulty. The mere suggestion of an imperfection in the character of Jesus made him shudder, and he checked me with raised hand. You are blaspheming. The very thought is a terrible sin. Would he recommend me any books that might throw light on the subject? No, no, you have read too much already. You must pray, you must pray. When I urged that I could not believe without proof, I was told, 
Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. And my further questioning was checked by the murmur, Oh, my child, how undisciplined, how impatient. Truly he must have found in me, hot, eager, passionate in my determination to know, resolute not to profess belief while belief was absent, nothing of the meek, chastened, submissive spirit with which he was wont to deal in penitence seeking his counsel as their spiritual guide. In vain did he bid me pray as though I believed. In vain did he urge the duty of blind submission to the authority of the church, of blind, unreasoning faith that questioned not. I had not trodden the thorny path of doubt to come to the point from which I had started. I needed and would have solid grounds ere I believed. He had no conception of the struggles of a skeptical spirit. He had evidently never felt the pangs of doubt. His own faith was solid as a rock, firm, satisfied, unshakable. He would as soon have committed suicide as have doubted of the infallibility of the universal church. It is not your duty to ascertain the truth, he told me sternly. It is your duty to accept and believe the truth as laid down by the church. At your peril you reject it. The responsibility is not yours so long as you dutifully accept that which the church has laid down for your acceptance. Did not the Lord promise that the presence of the Spirit should be ever with his church to guide her into all truth? But the fact of the promise and its value are just the very points on which I am doubtful, I answered. He shuddered. Pray, pray, he said. Father, forgive her, for she knows not what she says. It was in vain that I urged on him the sincerity of my seeking, pointing out that I had everything to gain by following his directions, everything to lose by going my own way, but that it seemed to me untruthful to pretend to accept what was not really believed. Everything to lose? Yes, indeed, you will be lost for time and lost for eternity. Lost or not, I rejoined, I must and will try to find out what is true, and I will not believe till I am sure. You have no right to make terms with God, he retorted, as to what you will believe or what you will not believe. You are full of intellectual pride. I sighed hopelessly. Little feeling of pride was there in me just then, but only a despairful feeling that in this rigid, unyielding dogmatism there was no comprehension of my difficulties, no help for me in my strugglings. I rose, and thanking him for his courtesy, said that I would not waste his time further, that I must go home and face the difficulties, openly leaving the church and taking the consequences. Then, for the first time, his serenity was ruffled. "'I forbid you to speak of your disbelief,' he cried. "'I forbid you to lead into your own lost state the souls for whom Christ died.' Slowly and sadly I took my way back to the station, knowing that my last chance of escape had failed me. I recognized in this famous divine the spirit of priestcraft that could be tender and pitiful to the sinner, repentant, humble, submissive, but that was iron to the doubter, the heretic, and would crush out all questionings of revealed truth, silencing by force, not by argument, all challenge of the traditions of the church. Out of such men were made the inquisitors of the Middle Ages, perfectly conscientious, perfectly rigid, perfectly merciless to the heretic. To them heretics are centers of infectious disease, and charity to the heretic is the worst cruelty to the souls of men. Certain that they hold, by no merit of our own, but by the mercy of our God, the one truth which he has revealed, they can permit no questionings, they can accept naught but the most complete submission. But while man aspires after truth, while his mind yearns after knowledge, while his intellect soars upward into the empyrean of speculation and beats the air with tireless wing, so long shall those who demand faith from him be met by challenge for proof, and those who would blind him shall be defeated by his resolve to gaze unblenching in the face of truth, even though her eyes should turn him into stone. It was during this same autumn of 1872 that I first met Mr. and Mrs. Scott, introduced to them by Mr. Voisey. At that time Thomas Scott was an old man with beautiful white hair, and eyes like those of a hawk gleaming from under shaggy eyebrows. He had been a man of magnificent physique, and, though his frame was then enfeebled, 
the splendid lion-like head kept its impressive strength and beauty, and told of a unique personality. Well-born and wealthy, he had spent his earlier life in adventure in all parts of the world, and after his marriage he had settled down at Ramsgate, and had made his home a centre of heretical thought. His wife, his right hand, as he justly called her, was young enough to be his daughter, a sweet, strong, gentle, noble woman, worthy of her husband, and than that no higher praise could be spoken. Mr. Scott for many years issued monthly a series of pamphlets, all heretical, though very varying in their shades of thought. All were well written, cultured, and polished in tone, and to this rule Mr. Scott made no exception. His writers might say what they liked, but they must have something to say, and must say it in good English. His correspondence was enormous, from prime ministers downwards. At his house met people of the most varied opinions. It was a veritable heretical salon. Colenso of Natal, Edward Maitland, E. Van Sittart Neal, Charles Bray, Sarah Hennell, and hundreds more, clerics and laymen, scholars and thinkers, all coming to this one house, to which the entree was gained only by love of truth and desire to spread freedom among men. For Thomas Scott, my first free-thought essay was written a few months after. On the Deity of Jesus of Nazareth, by the wife of a benefited clergyman. My name was not mine to use, so it was agreed that any essays from my pen should be anonymous. And now came the return to Sibsey, and with it the need for definite steps as to the church. For now I no longer doubted, I had rejected, and the time for silence was past. I was willing to attend the church services, taking no part in any not directed to God himself, but I could no longer attend the Holy Communion, for in that service, full of recognition of Jesus as deity and of his atoning sacrifice, I could no longer take part without hypocrisy. This was agreed to, and well do I remember the pain and trembling wherewith, on the first sacrament Sunday after my return, I rose and left the church. That the vicar's wife should communicate was as much a matter of course as that the vicar should administer. I had never done anything in public that would draw attention to me, and a feeling of deadly sickness nearly overcame me as I made my exit, conscious that every eye was on me, that my non-participation would be the cause of unending comment. As a matter of fact, everyone naturally thought I was suddenly taken ill, and I was overwhelmed with calls and inquiries. To any direct question I answered quietly that I was unable to take part in the profession of faith required by an honest communicant. But the statement was rarely necessary, as the idea of heresy in a vicar's wife is slow to suggest itself to the ordinary bucolic mind, and I proffered no information where no question was asked. It happened that, shortly after that, to me, memorable Christmas of 1872, a sharp epidemic of typhoid fever broke out in the village of Sibsey. The drainage there was of the most primitive type, and the contagion spread rapidly. Naturally fond of nursing, I found in this epidemic work just fitted to my hand, and I was fortunate enough to be able to lend personal help that made me welcome in the homes of the stricken poor. The mothers who slept exhausted while I watched beside their darling's bedsides will never, I like to fancy, think over harshly of the heretic whose hand was as tender and often more skillful than their own. I think Mother Nature meant me for a nurse, for I take a sheer delight in nursing anyone, provided only that there is peril in the sickness, so that there is the strange and solemn feeling of the struggle between the human skill one wields and the supreme enemy, death. There is a strange fascination in fighting death, step by step, and this is, of course, felt to the full where one fights for life as life, and not for a life one loves. When the patient is beloved, the struggle is touched with agony, but where one fights with death over the body of a stranger, there is a weird enchantment in the contest without personal pain, and as one forces back the hated foe, there is a curious triumph in the feeling which marks the death grip yielding up its prey, as one snatches back to earth the life which had well nigh perished. The spring of 1873 brought me knowledge of a power that was to mold much of my future life, I delivered my first lecture, but delivered it to rows of empty pews in Sibsey Church. A queer whim took me that I would like to know how it felt to preach, and vague fancies stirred in me that I could speak if I had the chance. 
I saw no platform in the distance, nor had any idea of possible speaking in the future dawned upon me. But the longing to find outlet in words came upon me, and I felt as though I had something to say and was able to say it. So, locked alone in the great silent church, whither I had gone to practice some organ exercises, I ascended the pulpit steps and delivered my first lecture on the inspiration of the Bible. I shall never forget the feeling of power and delight, but especially of power, that came upon me as I sent my voice ringing down the aisles, and the passion in me broke into balanced sentences and never paused for musical cadence or for rhythmical expression. All I wanted then was to see the church full of upturned faces, alive with throbbing sympathy, instead of the dreary emptiness of silent pews. And as though in a dream the solitude was peopled, and I saw the listening faces and the eager eyes, and as the sentences flowed unbidden from my lips and my own tones echoed back to me from the pillars of the ancient church, I knew of a verity that the gift of speech was mine, and that if ever, and then it seemed so impossible, if ever the chance came to me of public work, this power of melodious utterance should at least win hearing for any message I had to bring. But the knowledge remained a secret all to my own self for many a long month, for I quickly felt ashamed of that foolish speechifying in an empty church. But foolish as it was, I note it here as it was the first effort of that expression in spoken words which later became to me one of the deepest delights of life. And indeed no one can know, save they who have felt it, what joy there is in the full rush of language that moves and sways, to feel a crowd respond to the lightest touch, to see the faces brighten or darken at your bidding, to know that the sources of human emotion and human passion gush forth at the word of the speaker as the stream from the riven rock, to feel that the thought which thrills through a thousand hearers has its impulse from you, and throbs back to you the fuller from a thousand heartbeats. Is there any emotional joy in life more brilliant than this, fuller of passionate triumph and of the very essence of intellectual delight? In 1873 my marriage tie was broken. I took no new step, but my absence from the communion led to some gossip, and a relative of Mr. Besant pressed on him highly colored views of the social and professional dangers which would accrue if my heresy became known. My health, never really restored since the autumn of 1871, grew worse and worse, serious heart trouble having arisen from the constant strain under which I lived. At last, in July or August 1873, the crisis came. I was told that I must conform to the outward observances of the Church and attend the communion. I refused. Then came the distinct alternative, conformity or exclusion from home. In other words, hypocrisy or expulsion. I chose the latter. End of chapter 5, part 1「A bitterly sad time followed. My dear mother was heartbroken. To her, with her wide and vague form of Christianity, loosely held, the intensity of my feeling that where I did not believe I would not pretend belief was incomprehensible. She recognized far more fully than I did all that a separation from my home meant for me, and the difficulties that would surround a young woman, not yet twenty-six, living alone. She knew how brutally the world judges, and how the mere fact that a woman was young and alone justified any coarseness of slander. Then I did not guess how cruel men and women could be, how venomous their tongues! Now, knowing it, having faced slander and lived it down, I deliberately say that were the choice again before me, I would choose as I chose then. I would rather go through it all again than live in society under the burden of an acted lie. The hardest struggle was against my mother's tears and pleading. To cause her pain was tenfold pain to me. Against harshness I had been rigid as steel, but it was hard to remain steadfast when my darling mother, whom I loved as I loved nothing else on earth, threw herself on her knees before me, imploring me to yield. It seemed like a crime to bring such anguish on her, and I felt as a murderer as the snowy head was pressed against my knees. And yet, to live a lie? Not even for her was that shame possible. 
In that worst crisis of blinding agony, my will clung fast to truth. And it is true now, as it ever was, that he who loves father or mother better than truth is not worthy of her, and that the flint-strewn path of honesty is the way to light and peace. Then there were the children, the two little ones who worshipped me, who was to them mother, nurse, and playfellow. Were they, too, demanded at my hands? Not wholly, for a time. Facts which I need not touch on here enabled my brother to obtain for me a legal separation, and when everything was arranged, I found myself guardian of my little daughter, and possessor of a small monthly income sufficient for respectable starvation. With a great price I had obtained my freedom, but I was free. Home, friends, social position were the price demanded and paid, and being free I wondered what to do with my freedom. I could have had a home with my brother if I would give up my heretical friends and keep quiet, but I had no mind to put my limbs into fetters again, and in my youthful inexperience I determined to find something to do. The difficulty was the something, and I spent various shillings in agencies which with a quite wonderful unanimity of failures. I tried fancy needlework, offered to ladies in reduced circumstances, and earned four shillings six pence by some weeks of stitching. I experimented with the Birmingham firm, who generously offered everyone the opportunity of adding to their incomes, and on sending the small fee demanded, received a pencil case, with an explanation that I was to sell little articles of that description, going as far as cruet stands to my friends. I did not feel equal to springing pencil cases and cruet stands on my acquaintances, so did not enter on that line of business, and similar failures and numerous efforts made me feel, as so many others have found, that the world oyster is hard to open. However, I was resolute to build a nest for my wee daughter, my mother, and myself, and the first thing to do was to save my monthly pittance to buy furniture. I found a tiny house in Colby Road, Upper Norwood, near the Scots, who were more than good to me, and arranged to take it in the spring, and then accepted a loving invitation to Folkestone, where my grandmother and two aunts were living, to look for work there, and found it. The vicar wanted a governess, and one of my aunts suggested me as a stopgap, and thither I went with my little Mabel, our board and lodging being payment for my work. I became head cook, governess, and nurse, glad enough to have found something to do that enabled me to save my little income. But I do not think I will ever take to cooking for a permanence. Broiling and frying are all right, and making pie crust is rather pleasant, but saucepans and kettles blister your hands. There is a charm in making a stew, to the unaccustomed cook, from the excitement of wondering what the result will be, and whether any flavor save that of onions will survive the competition in the mixture. On the whole, my cooking, strictly by cookery book, was a success, but my sweeping was bad, for I lacked muscle. This curious episode came to an abrupt end, for one of my little pupils fell ill with diphtheria, and I was transformed from cook to nurse. Mabel I dispatched to her grandmother, who adored her with a love condescendingly returned by the little fairy of three, and never was there a prettier picture than the red-gold curls nestled against the white, the baby grace in exquisite contrast with the worn stateliness of her tender nurse. Scarcely was my little patient out of danger when the youngest boy fell ill of scarlet fever. We decided to isolate him on the top floor, and I cleared away carpets and curtains, hung sheets over the doorways, and kept them wet with chloride of lime, shut myself up in there with the boy, having my meals left on the landing, and when all risk was over, proudly handed back my charge, the disease touching no one else in the house. And now the spring of 1874 had come, and in a few weeks my mother and I were to set up house together. How we had planned all, and had knitted on the new life together we anticipated to the old one we remembered how we had discussed Mabel's education, and the share which should fall to each. Daydreams, daydreams, never to be realized. My mother went up to town, and in a week or two I received a telegram saying she was dangerously ill, and as fast as express rain would take me I was beside her. Dying, the doctor said, three days she might live, no more. I told her the death sentence, but she said resolutely, I do not feel I am going to die just yet. 
and she was right. There was an attack of fearful prostration. The valves of the heart had failed, a very wrestling with death, and then the grim shadow drew backwards. I nursed her day and night with a very desperation of tenderness, for now fate had touched the thing dearest to me in life. A second horrible crisis came, and for the second time her tenacity and my love beat back the death stroke. She did not wish to die. The love of life was strong in her. I would not let her die. Between us we kept the foe at bay. Then dropsy supervened, and the end loomed slowly sure. It was then, after eighteen months' abstention, that I took the sacrament for the last time. My mother had an intense longing to communicate before she died, but absolutely refused to do so unless I took it with her. If it be necessary to salvation, she persisted doggedly, I will not take it if darling Annie is to be shut out. I would rather be lost with her than saved without her. I went to a clergyman I knew well and laid the case before him. As I expected, he refused to allow me to communicate. I tried a second with the same result. At last a thought struck me. There was Dean Stanley, my mother's favorite, a man known to be of the broadest school within the Church of England. Suppose I asked him. I did not know him, and I felt the request would be an impertinence, but there was just the chance that he might consent. And what would I not do to make my darling's deathbed easier? I said nothing to anyone but set out to the deanery, Westminster, timidly asked for the dean, and followed the servant upstairs with a sinking heart. I was left for a moment alone in the library, and, and then the dean came in. I don't think I ever in my life felt more intensely uncomfortable than I did in that minute's interval as he stood waiting for me to speak, his clear, grave, piercing eyes gazing questioningly into mine. Very falteringly, it must have been very clumsily, I preferred my request, stating boldly, with abrupt honesty, that I was not a Christian, that my mother was dying, that she was fretting to take the sacrament, that she would not take it unless I took it with her that two clergymen had refused to allow me to take part in the service, that I had come to him in despair, feeling how great was the intrusion, but she was dying. His face changed to a great softness. You were quite right to come to me, he answered, in that low musical voice of his, his keen gaze having altered into one no less direct but marvelously gentle. Of course I will go and see your mother, and I have little doubt that, if you will not mind talking over your position with me, we may see our way clear to doing as your mother wishes. I could barely speak my thanks, so much did the kindly sympathy move me. The revulsion from the anxiety and fear of rebuff was strong enough to be almost pain. But Dean Stanley did more than I asked. He suggested that he should call that afternoon and have a quiet chat with my mother, and then come again on the following day to administer the sacrament. A stranger's presence is always trying to a sick person, he said, with rare delicacy of thought, and, joined to the excitement of the service, it might be too much for your dear mother. If I spend half an hour with her today and administer the sacrament tomorrow, it will, I think, be better for her. So Dean Stanley came that afternoon all the way to Brompton and remained talking with my mother for about half an hour, and then set himself to understand my own position. He finally told me that conduct was far more important than theory, that he regarded all as Christians who recognized and tried to follow the moral law of Christ. On the question of the absolute deity of Jesus, he laid but little stress. Jesus was, in a special sense, the Son of God, but it was folly to quarrel over words with only human meanings when dealing with the mystery of the divine existence. And above all, it was folly to make such words into dividing walls between earnest souls. The one important matter was the recognition of duty to God and man, and all who were one in that recognition might rightfully join in an act of worship, the essence of which was not acceptance of dogma, but love of God and self-sacrifice for man. The Holy Communion, he concluded in his soft tones, was never meant to divide from each other hearts that are searching after the one true God. It was meant by its founder as a symbol of unity, not of strife. On the following day, Dean Stanley celebrated the Holy Communion by the bedside of my dear mother, 
and well was I repaid for the struggle it had cost me to ask so great a kindness from a stranger when I saw the comfort that gentle noble heart had given to her. He soothed away all her anxiety about my heresy with tactful wisdom, bidding her have no fear of differences of opinion where the heart was set on truth. Remember, she told me, he said to her, remember that our God is the God of truth, and that therefore the honest search for truth can never be displeasing in his eyes. Once again after that he came, and after his visit to my mother we had another long talk. I ventured to ask him, the conversation having turned that way, how, with views so broad as his, he found it possible to remain in communion with the Church of England. I think, he answered gently, that I am of more service to true religion by remaining in the Church and striving to widen its boundaries from within than if I left it and worked from without. And he went on to explain how, as Dean of Westminster, he was in a rarely independent position and could make the Abbey of a wider national service than would otherwise be possible. In all he said on this, his love for and his pride in the glorious Abbey were manifest, and it was easy to see that old historical associations, love of music, of painting, of stately architecture, were the bonds that held him bound to the old historic Church of England. His emotions, not his intellect, kept him churchman, and he shrank, with the oversensitiveness of the cultured scholar, from the idea of allowing the old traditions to be handled roughly by inartistic hands. Naturally of a refined and delicate nature, he had been rendered yet more exquisitely sensitive by the training of the college and the court. The polished courtesy of his manners was but the natural expression of a noble and lofty mind, a mind whose very gentleness sometimes veiled its strength. I have often heard Dean Stanley harshly spoken of, I have heard his honesty roughly challenged, but never has he been attacked in my presence that I have not uttered my protest against the injustice done him, and thus striven to repay some small fraction of that great debt of gratitude which I shall ever owe his memory. And now the end came swiftly. I had hurriedly furnished a couple of rooms in the little house, now ours, that I might take my mother into the purer air of Norwood, and permission was given to drive her down in an invalid carriage. The following evening she was suddenly taken worse. We lifted her into bed and telegraphed for the doctor. But he could do nothing, and she herself felt that the hand of death had gripped her. Selfless to the last, she thought but for my loneliness. I am leaving you alone, she sighed from time to time, and truly I felt, with an anguish I did not dare to realize, that when she died I should indeed be alone on earth. For two days longer she was with me, my beloved, and I never left her side for five minutes. On May 10th the weakness passed into gentle delirium, but even then the faithful eyes followed me about the room, until at length they closed forever. And as the sun sank low in the heavens, the breath came slower and slower, till the silence of death came down upon us and she was gone. Stunned and dazed with the loss, I went mechanically through the next few days. I would have none touch my dead save myself and her favorite sister, who was with us at the last. Cold and dry-eyed I remained, even when they hid her from me with a coffin lid, even all the dreary way to Kensal Green where her husband and her baby son were sleeping, and when we left her alone in the chill earth, damp with the rains of spring. I could not believe that our daydream was dead and buried, and the home in ruins ere yet it was fairly built. Truly, my house was left unto me desolate, and the rooms, filled with sunshine but unlighted by her presence, seemed to echo from their bare walls, You are all alone. But my little daughter was there, and her sweet face and her dancing feet broke the solitude, while her imperious claims for love and tendance forced me into attention to the daily needs of life. And life was hard in those days of spring and summer, resources small, and work difficult to find. In truth, the two months after my mother's death were the dreariest my life has known, and they were months of tolerably hard struggle. The little house in Colby Road taxed my slender resources heavily 
and the search for work was not yet successful. I do not know how I should have managed but for the help ever at hand of Mr. and Mrs. Thomas Scott. During this time I wrote for Mr. Scott pamphlets on inspiration, atonement, mediation and salvation, eternal torture, religious education of children, natural versus revealed religion, and the few guineas thus earned were very valuable. Their house, too, was always open to me, and this was no small help, for often in those days the little money I had was enough to buy food for two, but not enough to buy it for three. And I would go out and study all day at the British Museum, so as to have my dinner in town, the said dinner being conspicuous by its absence. If I was away for two evenings running from the hospitable house in the terrace, Mrs. Scott would come down to see what had happened, and many a time the supper there was of real physical value to me. Well might I write in 1879, when Thomas Scott lay dead. It was Thomas Scott whose house was open to me when my need was sorest, and he never knew, this generous, noble heart, how sometimes when I went in, weary and overdone from a long day's study in the British Museum, with scarce food to struggle through the day, he never knew how his genial, well, little lady, in welcoming tone, cheered the then utter loneliness of my life. To no living man save one do I owe the debt of gratitude that I owe to Thomas Scott. The small amount of jewelry I possessed and all my superfluous clothes were turned into more necessary articles, and the child at least never suffered from a solitary touch of want. My servant Mary was a wonderful contriver and kept house on the very slenderest funds that could be put into a servant's hands. And she also made the little place so bright and fresh-looking that it was always a pleasure to go into it. Recalling those days of hard living, I can now look on them without regret. More, I am glad to have passed through them, for they have taught me how to sympathize with those who are struggling as I struggled then, and I never can hear the words fall from pale lips, I am hungry, without remembering how painful a thing hunger is, and without curing that pain, at least for the moment. The presence of the child was good for me, keeping alive my aching, lonely heart. She would play contentedly for hours while I was working, a word now and again being enough for happiness. When I had to go out without her, she would run to the door with me, and the good-bye would come from down-turned lips. She was ever watching at the window for my return, and the sunny face was always the first to welcome me home. Many and many a time have I been coming home, weary, hungry, and heartsick, and the glimpse of the little face watching has reminded me that I must not carry in a grave face to sadden my darling, and the effort to throw off the depression for her sake threw it off altogether, and brought back the sunshine. She was the sweetness and joy of my life, my curly-headed darling, with her red-gold hair and glorious eyes, and passionate, willful, loving nature. The torn, bruised tendrils of my heart gradually twined round this little life. She gave something to love and to tend, and thus gratified one of the strongest impulses of my nature. End of chapter 5"'Charles Bradlow. "'During all these months the intellectual life had not stood still. "'I was slowly, cautiously feeling my way onward, "'and in the intellectual and social side of my life "'I found a delight unknown in the old days of bondage. First, there was the joy of freedom, "'the joy of speaking out frankly and honestly each thought. "'Truly I had a right to say, "'With a great price obtained I this freedom.' and having paid the price, I reveled in the liberty I had bought. Mr. Scott's valuable library was at my service. His keen brain challenged my opinions, probed my assertions, and suggested phases of thought hitherto untouched. I studied harder than ever, and the study now was unchecked by any fear of possible consequences. I had nothing left of the old faith save belief in a God, and that began slowly to melt away. The theistic axiom, if there be a God at all, he must be at least as good as his highest creature, began with an if, and to that if I turned my attention. Of all impossible things, writes Miss Frances Power Cobb, 
the most impossible must surely be that a man should dream something of the good and the noble and that it should prove at last that his creator was less good and less noble than he had dreamed but i question are we sure that there is a creator granted that if there is he must be above his highest creature but is there such a being the ground says the rev charles voisey on which our belief in god rests is man man parent of bibles and churches inspirer of all good thoughts and good deeds man the masterpiece of god's thought on earth man the textbook of all spiritual knowledge neither miraculous nor infallible man is nevertheless the only trustworthy record of the divine mind in things pertaining to god man's reason conscience and affections are the only true revelation of his maker but what if god were only man's own image reflected in the mirror of man's mind what if man were the creator not the revelation of his god it was inevitable that such thoughts should arise after the more palpably indefensible doctrines of christianity had been discarded once encouraged the human mind to think and bounds to the thinking can never again be set by authority once challenged traditional beliefs and the challenge will ring on every shield which is hanging in the intellectual arena around me was the atmosphere of conflict and freed from its long repression my mind leapt up to share in the strife with the joy in the intellectual tumult the intellectual strain i often attended south place chapel where moncure d conway was then preaching and discussion with him did something towards widening my views on the deeper religious problems i re-read dean mansell's bampton lectures and they did much towards turning me in the direction of atheism i re-read mill's examination of sir william hamilton's philosophy and studied carefully comte's philosophy positive gradually i recognized the limitations of human intelligence and its incapacity for understanding the nature of god presented as infinite and absolute i had given up the use of prayer as a blasphemous absurdity since an all-wise god could not need my suggestions nor an all-good god require my promptings but god fades out of the daily life of those who never pray a personal god who is not a providence is a superfluity when from the heaven does not smile a listening father it soon becomes an empty space whence resounds no echo of man's cry i could then reach no loftier conception of the divine than that offered by the orthodox and that broke hopelessly away as i analyzed it at last i said to mr scott mr scott may i write a tract on the nature and existence of god he glanced at me keenly ah little lady are you facing then that problem at last i thought it must come right away while this pamphlet was in manuscript an event occurred which colored all my succeeding life i met charles bradlaugh one day in the late spring talking with mrs conway one of the sweetest and steadiest natures whom it has been my lot to meet and to whom as to her husband i owe much for kindness generously shown when i was poor and had but few friends she asked me if i had been to the hall of science old street i answered with the stupid ignorant reflection of other people's prejudices so sadly common no i have never been there mr bradlaugh is rather a rough sort of speaker is he not he is the finest speaker of saxon english that i have ever heard she answered except perhaps john bright and his power over a crowd is something marvellous whether you agree with him or not you should hear him in the following july i went into the shop of mr edward truelove two fifty six high holborn in search of some comptist publications having come across his name as a publisher in the course of my study at the british museum on the counter was a copy of the national reformer and attracted by the title i bought it i read it placidly in the omnibus on my way to victoria station and found it excellent and was sent into convulsions of inward merriment when glancing up i saw an old gentleman gazing at me with horror speaking from every line of his countenance to see a young woman respectably dressed in crape reading an atheistic journal had evidently upset his peace of mind and he looked so hard at the paper that i was tempted to offer it to him but repressed the mischievous inclination this first copy of the paper with which i was to be so closely connected bore date july nineteenth eighteen seventy four 
and contained two long letters from a Mr. Arnold of Northampton attacking Mr. Bradlow, and a brief and singularly self-restrained answer from the latter. There was also an article in the National Secular Society which made me aware that there was an organization devoted to the propagandism of free thought. I felt that if such a society existed, I ought to belong to it, and I consequently wrote a short note to the editor of the National Reformer, asking whether it was necessary for a person to profess atheism before being admitted to the society. The answer appeared in the National Reformer. S.E. To be a member of the National Secular Society, it is only necessary to be able honestly to accept the four principles as given in the National Reformer of June 14th. This any person may do without being required to avow himself an atheist. Candidly, we can see no logical resting place between the entire acceptance of authority, as in the Roman Catholic Church, and the most extreme rationalism. If, on again looking to the principles of the society, you can accept them, we repeat to you our invitation. I sent my name in as an active member, and find it is recorded in the National Reformer of August 9th. Having received an intimation that Londoners could receive their certificates at the Hall of Science from Mr. Bradlow on any Sunday evening, I betook myself thither, and it was on August 2nd, 1874, that I first set foot in a free thought hall. The hall was crowded to suffocation, and at the very moment announced for the lecture, a roar of cheering burst forth. A tall figure passed swiftly up the hall to the platform, and with a slight bow in answer to the voluminous greeting, Charles Bradlow took his seat. I looked at him with interest, impressed and surprised. The grave, quiet, stern, strong face, the massive head, the keen eyes, the magnificent breadth and height of forehead, was this the man I had heard described as a blatant agitator, an ignorant demagogue? He began quietly and simply, tracing out the resemblances between the Krishna and the Christ myths, and as he went from point to point, his voice grew in force and resonance till it rang round the hall like a trumpet. Familiar with the subject, I could test the value of his treatment of it, and saw that his knowledge was as sound as his language was splendid. Eloquence, fire, sarcasm, pathos, passion, all in turn were bent against Christian superstition, till the great audience, carried away by the torrent of the orator's force, hung silent, breathing soft as he went on, till the silence that followed a magnificent peroration broke the spell, and a hurricane of cheers relieved the tension. He came down the hall with some certificates in his hand, glanced round, and handed me mine with a questioning, Mrs. Besant? Then he said, referring to my question as to the profession of atheism, that he would willingly talk over the subject of atheism with me if I would make an appointment, and offered me a book he had been using in his lecture. Long afterwards I asked him how he knew me, whom he had never seen, that he came straight to me in such fashion. He laughed and said he did not know, but glancing over the faces he felt sure that I was Annie Besant. From that first meeting in the Hall of Science dated a friendship that lasted unbroken till death severed the earthly bond, and that to me stretches through death's gateway and links us together still. As friends, not as strangers, we met swift recognition, as it were, leaping from eye to eye, and I know now that the instinctive friendliness was in very truth an outgrowth of strong friendship in other lives, and that on that August day we took up again an ancient tie. We did not begin a new one. And so in lives to come we shall meet again, and help each other as we helped each other in this. And let me here place on record, as I have done before, some word of what I owe him for his true friendship though indeed how great is my debt to him I can never tell. Some of his wise phrases have ever remained in my memory. You should never say you have an opinion on a subject until you have tried to study the strongest things set against the view to which you are inclined. You must not think you know a subject until you are acquainted with all that the best minds have said about it. No steady work can be done in public unless the worker study at home far more than he talks outside. Be your own harshest judge, listen to your own speech and criticize it. Read abuse of yourself and see what grains of truth are in it. Do not waste time by reading opinions that are mere echoes of your own. Read opinions you disagree with, and you will catch aspects of truth you do not readily see. 
Through our long comradeship he was my sternest as well as gentlest critic, pointing out to me that in a party like ours, where our own education and knowledge were above those whom we led, it was very easy to gain indiscriminate praise and unstinted admiration. On the other hand, we received from Christians equally indiscriminate abuse and hatred. It was therefore needful that we should be our own harshest judges, and that we should be sure that we knew thoroughly every subject that we taught. He saved me from the superficiality that my fatal facility of speech might so easily have induced. And when I began to taste the intoxication of easily won applause, his criticism of weak points, his challenge of weak arguments, his trained judgment, were of priceless service to me, and what of value there is in my work is very largely due to his influence, which at once stimulated and restrained. One very charming characteristic of his was his extreme courtesy in private life, especially to women. This outward polish, which sat so gracefully on his massive frame and stately presence, was foreign rather than English, for the English as a rule, save such as go to court, are singularly unpolished people, and it gave his manner a peculiar charm. I asked him once where he had learned his gracious fashions that were so un-English. He would stand with an uplifted hat as he asked a question of a maidservant, or handed a woman into a carriage, and he answered with a half-smile, half-scoff, that it was only in England that he was an outcast from society. In France, in Spain, in Italy, he was always welcomed among men and women of the highest social rank, and he supposed that he had unconsciously caught the foreign tricks of manner. Moreover, he was absolutely indifferent to all questions of social position. Peer or artisan, it was to him exactly the same. He never seemed conscious of the distinctions of which men make so much. Our first conversation after the meeting at the Hall of Science took place a day or two later in his little study in 29 Turner Street, Commercial Road, a wee room overflowing with books, in which he looked singularly out of place. Later I learned that he had failed in business in consequence of Christian persecution, and resolute to avoid bankruptcy he had sold everything he possessed, save his books, had sent his wife and daughters to live in the country with his father-in-law, had taken two tiny rooms in Turner Street, where he could live for a mere trifle, and had bent himself to the task of paying off the liabilities he had incurred, incurred in consequence of his battling for political and religious liberty. I took with me my manuscript essay On the Nature and Existence of God, and it served as the basis of our conversation. We found there was little difference in our views. You have thought yourself into atheism without knowing it, he said, and all that I changed in the essay was the correction of the vulgar error that the atheist says there is no God, by the insertion of a passage disclaiming this position from an essay pointed out to me by Mr. Bradlow. And at this stage of my life story it is necessary to put very clearly the position I took up and held so many years as an atheist, because otherwise the further evolution into theosophist will be wholly incomprehensible. It will lead me into metaphysics, and to some readers these are dry, but if anyone would understand the evolution of a soul, he must be willing to face the questions which the soul faces in its growth. And the position of the philosophic atheist is so misunderstood that it is the more necessary to put it plainly. And theosophists, at least, in reading it, will see how theosophy stepped in, finally, as a further evolution towards knowledge, rendering rational, and therefore acceptable, the loftiest spirituality that the human mind can as yet conceive. In order that I may not color my past thinkings by my present thought, I take my statements from pamphlets written when I adopted the atheistic philosophy, and while I continued an adherent thereof. No charge can then be made that I have softened my old opinions for the sake of reconciling them with those now held. End of chapter 6「Atheism as I Knew and Taught It » The first step which leaves behind the idea of a limited and personal God an extra-cosmic creator, and leads the student to the point whence atheism and pantheism diverge, 
is the recognition that a profound unity of substance underlies the infinite diversities of natural phenomena, the discernment of the one beneath the many. This was the step I had taken ere my first meeting with Charles Bradlaugh, and I had written, It is manifest to all who will take the trouble to think steadily that there can be only one eternal and underived substance, and that matter and spirit must therefore only be varying manifestations of this one substance. The distinction made between matter and spirit is, then, simply made for the sake of convenience and clearness, just as we may distinguish perception from judgment, both of which, however, are alike processes of thought. Matter is, in its constituent elements, the same as spirit. Existence is one, however manifold its phenomena. Life is one, however multiform its evolution. As the heat of the coal differs from the coal itself, so do memory, perception, judgment, emotion, and will differ from the brain, which is the instrument of thought. But nevertheless they are all equally products of the one soul substance varying only in their conditions. I find myself then compelled to believe that one only substance exists in all around me, that the universe is eternal, or at least eternal so far as our faculties are concerned, since we cannot, as someone has quaintly put it, get to the outside of everywhere, that a deity cannot be conceived of as apart from the universe, that the worker and the work are inextricably interwoven, and in some sense eternally and indissolubly combined. Having got so far, we will proceed to examine into the possibility of proving the existence of that one essence popularly called by the name of God, under the conditions strictly defined by the Orthodox. Having demonstrated, as I hope to do, that the Orthodox idea of God is unreasonable and absurd, we will endeavor to ascertain whether any idea of God, worthy to be called an idea, is attainable in the present state of our faculties. The deity must of necessity be that one and only substance out of which all things are evolved, under the uncreated conditions and eternal laws of the universe. He must be, as Theodore Parker somewhat oddly puts it, the materiality of matter as well as the spirituality of spirit, i.e., these must both be products of this one substance, a truth which is readily accepted as soon as spirit and matter are seen to be but different modes of one essence. Thus we identify substance with the all-comprehending and vivifying force of nature, and in so doing we simply reduce to a physical impossibility the existence of the being described by the orthodox as a god possessing the attributes of personality. The deity becomes identified with nature, coextensive with the universe, but the God of the Orthodox no longer exists. We may change the signification of God and use the word to express a different idea, but we can no longer mean by it a personal being in the Orthodox sense, possessing an individuality which divides him from the rest of the universe. Proceeding to search whether any idea of God was attainable, I came to the conclusion that evidence of the existence of a conscious power was lacking and that the ordinary proofs offered were inconclusive, that we could grasp phenomena and no more. There appears also to be a possibility of a mind in nature, though we have seen that intelligence is, strictly speaking, impossible. There cannot be perception, memory, comparison, or judgment, but may there not be a perfect mind, unchanging, calm, and still? Our faculties fail us when we try to estimate the deity, and we are betrayed into contradictions and absurdities. But does it therefore follow that he is not? It seems to me that to deny his existence is to overstep the boundaries of our thought power almost as much as to try and define it. We pretend to know the unknown if we declare him to be the unknowable. Unknowable to us at present, yes. Unknowable forever, in other possible stages of existence? We have reached a region into which we cannot penetrate. Here all human faculties fail us. We bow our heads on the threshold of the unknown. And the ear of man cannot hear, and the eye of man cannot see. But if we could see and hear this vision, were it not he? Thus sings Alfred Tennyson, 
the poet of metaphysics, if we could see and hear. Alas, it is always an if. This refusal to believe without evidence, and the declaration that anything behind phenomena is unknowable to man as at present constituted, these are the two chief planks of the atheistic platform, as atheism was held by Charles Bradlaugh and myself. In 1876 this position was clearly reaffirmed. It is necessary to put briefly the atheistic position, for no position is more continuously and more persistently misrepresented. Atheism is without God. It does not assert no God. The atheist does not say, there is no God, but he says, I know not what you mean by God. I am without idea of God. The word God to me is a sound conveying no clear or distinct affirmation. I do not deny God because I cannot deny that of which I have no conception, and that conception of which, by its affirmer, is so imperfect that he is unable to define it to me. Charles Bradlaugh, Freethinker's Textbook, page 118. The atheist neither affirms nor denies the possibility of phenomena differing from those recognized by human experience. As his knowledge of the universe is extremely limited and very imperfect, the atheist declines either to deny or to affirm anything with regard to modes of existence of which he knows nothing. Further, he refuses to believe anything concerning that of which he knows nothing, and affirms that that which can never be the subject of knowledge ought never to be the object of belief. While the atheist, then, neither affirms nor denies the unknown, he does deny all which conflicts with the knowledge to which he has already attained. For example, he knows that one is one, and that three times one are three. He denies that three times one are, or can be, one. The position of the atheist is a clear and a reasonable one. I know nothing about God, and therefore I do not believe in him or in it. What you tell me about your God is self-contradictory and is therefore incredible. I do not deny God, which is an unknown tongue to me. I do deny your God, who is an impossibility. I am without God. Up to 1887 I find myself writing on the same lines. No man can rationally affirm there is no God until the word God has for him a definite meaning, and until everything that exists is known to him, and known with what Leibniz calls perfect knowledge. The atheist's denial of the gods begins only when these gods are defined or described. Never yet has a god been defined in terms which were not palpably self-contradictory and absurd. Never yet has a god been described so that a concept of him was made possible to human thought, nor is anything gained by the asserters of deity when they allege that he is incomprehensible. If God exists and is incomprehensible, his incomprehensibility is an admirable reason for being silent about him, but can never justify the affirmation of self-contradictory propositions and the threatening of people with damnation if they do not accept them. The belief of the atheist stops where his evidence stops. He believes in the existence of the universe, judging the accessible proof thereof to be adequate, and he finds in this universe sufficient cause for the happening of all phenomena. He finds no intellectual satisfaction in placing a gigantic conundrum behind the universe, which only adds its own unintelligibility to the already sufficiently difficult problem of existence. Our lungs are not fitted to breathe beyond the atmosphere which surrounds our globe, and our faculties cannot breathe outside the atmosphere of the phenomenal. And I summed up this essay with the words, I do not believe in God. My mind finds no grounds on which to build up a reasonable faith. My heart revolts against the specter of an almighty indifference to the pain of sentient beings. My conscience rebels against the injustice, the cruelty, the inequality which surrounds me on every side. But I believe in man in man's redeeming power, in man's remolding energy, in man's approaching triumph through knowledge, love, and work. These views of existence naturally color all views of life and of the existence of the soul. And here steps in the profound difference between atheism and pantheism. Both posit an existence at present inscrutable by human faculties, of which all phenomena are modes. But to the atheist, that existence manifests as force-matter, 
unconscious, unintelligent, while to the pantheist it manifests as life matter, conscious, intelligent. To the one, life and consciousness are attributes, properties, dependent upon arrangements of matter. To the other they are fundamental, essential, and only limited in their manifestation by arrangements of matter. Despite the attraction held for me in Spinoza's luminous arguments, the overmastering sway which science was beginning to exercise over me drove me to seek for the explanation of all problems of life and mind at the hands of the biologist and the chemist. They had done so much, explained so much. Could they not explain all? Surely, I thought, the one safe ground is that of experiment, and the remembered agony of doubt made me very slow to believe where I could not prove. So I was fain to regard life as an attribute, and this again strengthened the atheistic position. Scientifically regarded, life is not an entity but a property. It is not a mode of existence, but a characteristic of certain modes. Life is the result of an arrangement of matter, and when rearrangement occurs, the former result can no longer be present. We call the result of the changed arrangement death. Life and death are two convenient words for expressing the general outcome of two arrangements of matter one of which is always found to precede the other. And then, having resorted to chemistry for one illustration, I took another from one of those striking and easily grasped analogies, facility for seeing and presenting which has ever been one of the secrets of my success as a propagandist. Like pictures, they impress the mind of the hearer with a vivid sense of reality. Everyone knows the exquisite iridescence of Mother of Pearl, the tender, delicate hues which melt into each other, glowing with soft radiance. How different is the dull, dead surface of a piece of wax! Yet take that dull, black wax and mold it so closely to the surface of the mother of pearl that it shall take every delicate marking of the shell, and when you raise it the seven-hued glory shall smile at you from the erstwhile colorless surface. For though it be to the naked eye imperceptible, all the surface of the mother of pearl is in delicate ridges and furrows like the surface of a newly ploughed field, and when the waves of light come dashing up against the ridged surface, they are broken like the waves on a shingly shore, and are flung backwards so that they cross each other and the oncoming waves. And as every ray of white light is made up of waves of seven colours, and these waves differ in length each from the others, the fairy ridges fling them backward separately, and each ray reaches the eye by itself so that the color of the mother of pearl is really the spray of the light waves, and comes from the arrangement of matter once again. Give the dull black wax the same ridges and furrows, and its glory shall differ in nothing from that of the shell. To apply our illustration, as the color belongs to one arrangement of matter, and the dead surface to another, so life belongs to some arrangements of matter and is their resultant, while the resultant of other arrangements is death. The same line of reasoning naturally was applied to the existence of spirit in man, and it was argued that mental activity, the domain of the spirit, was dependent on bodily organization. When the babe is born it shows no sign of mind. For a brief space hunger and repletion, cold and warmth are its only sensations. Slowly the specialized senses begin to function, still more slowly muscular movements, at first aimless and reflex, become coordinated and consciously directed. There is no sign here of an intelligent spirit controlling a mechanism. There is every sign of a learning and developing intelligence, developing pari passu with the organism of which it is a function. As the body grows, the mind grows with it, and the childish mind of the child develops into the hasty, quick-judging, half-informed, unbalanced, youthful mind of the youth. With maturity of years comes maturity of mind, and body and mind are vigorous and in their prime. As old age comes on and the bodily functions decay, the mind decays also, until age passes into senility, and the body and mind sink into second childhood. Has the immortal spirit decayed with the organization, or is it dwelling in sorrow, bound in its house of clay? If this be so, the spirit must be unconscious or else separate from the very individual whose essence it is supposed to be. For the old man does not suffer when his mind is senile, but is contented as a little child. 
And not only is this constant, simultaneous growth and decay of body and mind to be observed, but we know that the mental functions are disordered and suspended by various physical conditions. Alcohol, many drugs, fever, disorder the mind. A blow on the cranium suspends its functions, and the spirit returns with the surgeon's trepanning. Does the spirit take part in dreams? Is it absent from the idiot, from the lunatic? Is it guilty of manslaughter when the madman murders, or does it helplessly watch its own instrument performing actions at which it shudders? If it can only work here through an organism, is its nature changed in its independent life, severed from all with which it was identified? Can it, in its disembodied state, have anything in common with its past? It will be seen that my unbelief in the existence of the soul or spirit was a matter of cold, calm reasoning. As I wrote in 1885, For many of us evidence must precede belief. I would gladly believe in a happy immortality for all, as I would gladly believe that all misery and crime and poverty will disappear in 1885, if I could. But I am unable to believe an improbable proposition unless convincing evidence is brought in support of it. Immortality is most improbable. No evidence is brought forward in its favor. I cannot believe only because I wish. Such was the philosophy by which I lived, from 1874 to 1886, when first some researches that will be dealt with in their proper place, and which led me ultimately to the evidence I had before vainly demanded, began to shake my confidence in its adequacy. Amid outer storm and turmoil and conflict, I found it satisfy my intellect, while lofty ideals of morality fed my emotions. I called myself atheist, and rightly so, for I was without God, and my horizon was bounded by life on earth. I gloried in the name then, as it is dear to my heart now, for all the associations with which it is connected. Quote, Atheist is one of the grandest titles a man can wear. It is the order of merit of the world's heroes. Most great discoverers, most deep-thinking philosophers, most earnest reformers, most toiling pioneers of progress, have in their turn had flung at them the name of atheist. It was howled over the grave of Copernicus. It was clamored round the death-pile of Bruno. It was yelled at Vanini, at Spinoza, at Priestley, at Voltaire, at Paine. It has become the laurel bay of the hero, the halo of the martyr, in the world's history it has meant the pioneer of progress, and where the cry of atheist is raised, there we may be sure that another step is being taken towards the redemption of humanity. The saviors of the world are too often howled at as atheists, and then worshipped as deities. The atheists are the vanguard of the army of free thought, on whom falls the brunt of the battle, and are shivered the hardest of the blows. Their feet trample down the thorns that others may tread unwounded. Their bodies fill up the ditch that, by the bridge thus made, others may pass to victory. Honor to the pioneers of progress. Honor to the vanguard of liberty's army. Honor to those who, to improve earth, have forgotten heaven, and who, in their zeal for man, have forgotten God. Unquote. This poor sketch of the conception of the universe to which I had conquered my way at the cost of so much pain, and which was the inner center round which my life revolved for twelve years, may perhaps show that, that the atheistic philosophy is misjudged sorely when it is scouted as vile or condemned as intellectually degraded. It has outgrown anthropomorphic deities, and it leaves us face to face with nature, open to all her purifying, strengthening inspirations. There is only one kind of prayer, it says, which is reasonable, and that is the deep, silent adoration of the greatness and beauty and order around us as revealed in the realms of non-rational life and in humanity, as we bow our heads before the laws of the universe and mold our lives into obedience to their voice, we find a strong, calm peace steal over our hearts, a perfect trust in the ultimate triumph of the right, a quiet determination to make our lives sublime. Before our own high ideals, before those lives which show us how high the tides of divine life have risen in the human world, we stand with hushed voice and veiled face. From them we draw strength to emulate, and even dare struggle to excel. 
The contemplation of the ideal is true prayer. It inspires, it strengthens, it ennobles. The other part of prayer is work, from contemplation to labor, from the forest to the street. Study nature's laws, conform to them, work in harmony with them, and work becomes a prayer and a thanksgiving, an adoration of the universal wisdom, and a true obedience to the universal law. To a woman of my temperament, filled with passionate desire for the battering of the world, the elevation of humanity, a lofty system of ethics was even more important than a logical intellectual conception of the universe. And the total loss of all faith in a righteous God only made me more strenuously assertive of the binding nature of duty and the overwhelming importance of conduct. In 1874 this conviction found voice in a pamphlet on The True Basis of Morality. And in all the years of my propaganda on the platform of the National Secular Society, no subject was more frequently dealt with in my lectures than that of human ethical growth and the duty of man to man. No thought was more constantly in my mind than that of the importance of morals, and it was voiced at the very outset of my public career. Speaking of the danger lest, in these stirring times of inquiry, old sanctions of right conduct should be cast aside, ere new ones were firmly established, I wrote, it therefore becomes the duty of everyone who fights in the ranks of free thought and who ventures to attack the dogmas of the churches and to strike down the superstitions which enslave man's intellect to beware how he uproots the sanctions of morality which he is too weak to replace, or how, before he is prepared with better ones, he removes the barriers which do yet, however poorly, to some extent check vice and repress crime. That which touches morality touches the heart of society, a high and pure morality is the lifeblood of humanity. Mistakes in belief are inevitable and are of little moment. Mistakes in life destroy happiness, and their destructive consequences spread far and wide. It is then a very important question whether we who are endeavoring to take away from the world the authority on which has hitherto been based all its morality can offer a new and firm ground whereupon may safely be built up the fair edifice of a noble life. End of chapter 7, part 1。I then proceeded to analyze revelation and intuition as a basis for morals, and discarding both, I asserted, the true basis of morality is utility, that is, the adaptation of, of our actions to the promotion of the general welfare and happiness the endeavor so to rule our lives that we may serve and bless mankind. And I argued for this basis, showing that the effort after virtue was implied in the search for happiness. Virtue is an indispensable part of all true and solid happiness, but it is, after all, only reasonable that happiness should be the ultimate test of right and wrong. If we live as we do in a realm of law, obedience to law must necessarily result in harmony, and disobedience in discord. But if obedience to law result in harmony, it must also result in happiness. All through nature obedience to law results in happiness, and through obedience each living thing fulfills the perfection of its being, and in that perfection finds its true happiness. It seemed to me most important to remove morality from the controversies about religion and to give it a basis of its own. As, then, the grave subject of the existence of deity is a matter of dispute, it is evidently of deep importance to society that morality should not be dragged into this battleground, to stand or totter with the various theories of the divine nature which human thought creates and destroys. If we can found morality on a basis apart from theology, we shall do humanity a service which can scarcely be overestimated. A study of the facts of nature, of the consequences of man in society, seemed sufficient for such a basis. Our faculties do not suffice to tell us about God. They do suffice to study phenomena and to deduce laws from correlated facts. Surely then we should do wisely to concentrate our strength and our energies on the discovery of the attainable instead of on the search after the unknowable. If we are told that morality consists in obedience to the supposed will of a supposedly perfectly moral being because in so doing we please God, 
then we are at once placed in a region where our faculties are useless to us and where our judgment is at fault. But if we are told that we are to lead noble lives because nobility of life is desirable for itself alone, because in so doing we are acting in harmony with the laws of nature, because in so doing we spread happiness around our pathway and gladden our fellow men, then indeed motives are appealed to which spring forward to meet the call, and chords are struck in our hearts which respond in music to the touch. It was the establishment of this secure basis that I bent my energies. This that was to me of supreme moment. Amid the fervid movement of society, with its wild theories and crude social reforms, with its righteous fury against oppression and its unconsidered notions of wider freedom and gladder life, it is of vital importance that morality should stand on a foundation unshakable, that so through all political and religious revolutions human life may grow purer and nobler, may rise upward into settled freedom, and not sink downwards into anarchy. Only utility can afford us a sure basis, the reasonableness of which will be accepted alike by thoughtful student and hard-headed artisan. Utility appeals to all alike, and sets in action motives which are found equally in every human heart. Well shall it be for humanity that creeds and dogmas pass away, that superstition vanishes, and the clear light of freedom and science dawns on a regenerated earth. But well only if men draw tighter and closer the links of trustworthiness, of honor, and of truth. Equality before the law is necessary and just. Liberty is the birthright of every man and woman. Free individual development will elevate and glorify the race. But little worth these priceless jewels, little worth liberty and equality with all their promise for mankind, little worth even wider happiness, if that happiness be selfish, if true fraternity, true brotherhood, do not knit man to man and heart to heart, in loyal service to the common need and generous self-sacrifice to the common good. To the forwarding of this moral growth of man two things seemed to me necessary, an ideal which should stir the emotions and impel to action and a clear understanding of the sources of evil and of the methods by which they might be drained. Into the drawing of the first I threw all the passion of my nature, striving to paint the ideal in colors which should enthrall and fascinate, so that love and desire to realize might stir man to effort. If morality touched by emotion be religion, then truly was I the most religious of atheists, finding in this dwelling on and glorifying of the ideal full satisfaction for the loftiest emotions. To meet the fascination exercised over men's hearts by the man of sorrows, I raised the image of man triumphant, man perfected. Rightly is the ideal Christian type of humanity a man of sorrows. Jesus, with worn and wasted body, with sad, thin lips curved into a mournful droop of penitence for human sin, with weary eyes gazing up to heaven because despairing of earth, bowed down and aged with grief and pain, broken-hearted with long anguish, broken-spirited with unresisted ill-usage. Such is the ideal man of the Christian creed. Beautiful with a certain pathetic beauty, telling of the long travail of earth, eloquent of the sufferings of humanity, but not the model type to which men should conform their lives if they would make humanity glorious. And therefore, in radiant contrast with this, stands out in the sunshine and under the blue summer sky, far from graveyards and torture of death agony, the fair ideal humanity of the atheist. In form strong and fair, perfect in physical development as the Hercules of Grecian art, radiant with love, glorious in self-reliant power, with lips bent firm to resist oppression and melting into soft curves of passion and of pity, with deep far-seeing eyes, gazing piercingly into the secrets of the unknown, and resting lovingly on the beauties around him, with hands strong to work in the present, with heart full of hope which the future shall realize, making earth glad with his labor and beautiful with his skill. This, this is the ideal man, enshrined in the atheist's heart. The ideal humanity of the Christian is the humanity of the slave, poor, meek, broken-spirited, humble, submissive to authority, 
however oppressive and unjust. The ideal humanity of the atheist is the humanity of the free man who knows no lord, who brooks no tyranny, who relies on his own strength, who makes his brother's quarrel his, proud, true-hearted, loyal, brave. A one-sided view? Yes, but a very natural outcome of a sunny nature, for years held down by unhappiness and the harshness of an outgrown creed. It was the rebound of such a nature suddenly set free, rejoicing in its liberty and self-conscious strength, and it carried with it a great power of rousing the sympathetic enthusiasm of men and women, deeply conscious of their own restrictions and their own longings. It was the cry of the freed soul that had found articulate expression, and the many inarticulate and prisoned souls answered to it tumultuously, with fluttering of caged wings. With hot insistence I battled for the inspiration to be drawn from the beauty and grandeur of which human life was capable. Will anyone exclaim, You are taking all beauty out of human life, all hope, all warmth, all inspiration? You give us cold duty for filial obedience and inexorable law in the place of God? All beauty from life? Is there then no beauty in the idea of forming part of the great life of the universe? no beauty in conscious harmony with nature, no beauty in faithful service, no beauty in ideals of every virtue? All hope? Why, I give you more than hope, I give you certainty. If I bid you labor for this world, it is with the knowledge that this world will repay you a thousandfold, because society will grow purer, freedom more settled, law more honored, life more full and glad. What is your heaven? a heaven in the clouds. I point to a heaven attainable on earth. All warmth? What? You serve warmly a God unknown and invisible, in a sense the projected shadow of your own imaginings, and can only serve coldly your brother, whom you see at your side. There is no warmth in brightening the lot of the sad, in reforming abuses, in establishing equal justice for rich and poor, you find warmth in the church, but none in the home? Warmth in imagining the cloud glories of heaven, but none in creating substantial glories on earth? All inspiration? If you want inspiration to feeling, to sentiment, perhaps you had better keep to your Bible and your creeds. If you want inspiration to work, go and walk through the east of London or the back streets of Manchester. You are inspired to tenderness as you gaze at the wounds of Jesus, dead in Judea long ago, and find no inspiration in the wounds of men and women dying in the England of today? You have tears to shed for him, but none for the sufferer at your doors? His passion arouses your sympathies, but you see no pathos in the passion of the poor? Duty is colder than filial obedience? What do you mean by filial obedience? Obedience to your ideal of goodness and love, is it not so? Then how is duty cold? I offer you ideals for your homage. Here is truth for your mistress, to whose exaltation you shall devote your intellect. Here is freedom for your general, for whose triumph you shall fight. Here is love for your inspirer, who shall influence your every thought. Here is man for your master, not in heaven but on earth, to whose service you shall consecrate every faculty of your being. Inexorable law in the place of God? Yes, a stern certainty that you shall not waste your life, yet gather a rich reward at the close, that you shall not sow misery, yet reap gladness, that you shall not be selfish, yet be crowned with love, nor shall you sin, yet find safety in repentance. True, our creed is a stern one, stern with the beautiful sternness of nature. But if we be in the right, look to yourselves. Laws do not check their action for your ignorance. Fire will not cease to scorch because you did not know. With equal vigor did I maintain that virtue was its own reward, and that payment on the other side of the grave was unnecessary as an incentive to right living. What shall we say to Miss Cobb's contention that duty will grow gray and cold without God and immortality? Yes, for those with whom duty is a matter of selfish calculation, and who are virtuous only because they look for a golden crown in payment on the other side of the grave. 
those of us who find joy in right doing, who work because work is useful to our fellows, who live well because in such living we pay our contribution to the world's wealth, leaving earth richer than we found it. We need no paltry payment after death for our life's labor, for in that labor is its own exceeding great reward. But did anyone yearn for immortality that not all of me shall die? Is it true that atheism has no immortality? What is true immortality? Is Beethoven's true immortality in his continued personal consciousness or in his glorious music deathless while the world endures? Is Shelley's true life in his existence in some far-off heaven or in the pulsing liberty his lyrics send through men's hearts when they respond to the strains of his lyre? Music does not die, though one instrument be broken. Thought does not die, though one brain be shivered. Love does not die, though one's heartstrings be rent. And no great thinker dies so long as his thought re-echoes through the ages, its melody the fuller toned the more human brains send its music on. Not only to the hero and the sage is this immortality given. It belongs to each according to the measure of his deeds. Worldwide life for worldwide service, straightened life for straightened work, each reaps as he sows, and the harvest is gathered by each in his rightful order. This longing to leave behind a name that will live among men by right of service done them, this yearning for human love and approval that springs naturally from the practical and intense realization of human brotherhood, these will be found as strong motives in the breasts of the most earnest men and women who have in our generation identified themselves with the free-thought cause. They shine through the written and spoken words of Charles Bradlaugh all through his life, and every friend of his knows how often he has expressed the longing that, when the grass grows green over my grave, men may love me a little for the work I try to do. Needless to say that in the many controversies in which I took part, it was often urged against me that such motives were insufficient, that they appealed only to natures already ethically developed, and left the average man, and above all the man below the average, with no sufficiently constraining motive for right conduct. I resolutely held to my faith in human nature, and the inherent response of the human heart when appealed to from the highest grounds. Strange, I often think now, this instinctive certainty I had of man's innate grandeur that governed all my thought, inconsistent as that certainty was with my belief in his purely animal ancestry. Pressed too hard, I would take refuge in a passionate disdain for all who did not hear the thrilling voice of virtue and love her for her own sweet sake. I have myself heard the question asked, Why should I seek for truth? And why should I lead a good life if there be no immortality in which to reap a reward? To this question the freethinker has one clear and short answer. There is no reason why you should seek truth, if to you the search has no attracting power. There is no reason why you should lead a noble life, if you find your happiness in leading a poor and a base one. Friends, no one can enjoy a happiness which is too high for his capabilities. A book may be of intensest interest, but a dog will very much prefer being given a bone. To him whose highest interest is centered in his own miserable self, to him who cares only to gain his own ends, to him who seeks only his own individual comfort, to that man free thought can have no attraction. Such a man may indeed be made religious by a bribe of heaven. He may be led to seek for truth, because he hopes to gain his reward hereafter by the search. But truth disdains the service of the self-seeker. She cannot be grasped by a hand that itches for reward. If truth is not loved for her own pure sake, if to lead a noble life, if to make men happier, if to spread brightness around us, if to leave the world better than we found it, if these aims have no attraction for us, if these thoughts do not inspire us, then we are not worthy to be secularists. We have no right to the proud title of free thinkers. If you want to be paid for your good lives by living forever in a lazy and useless fashion in an idle heaven, if you want to be bribed into nobility of life, if, like silly children, you learn your lesson not to gain knowledge but to win sugar plums, then you had better go back to your creeds and your churches.
They are all you are fit for. You are not worthy to be free. But we, who, having caught a glimpse of the beauty of truth, deem the possession of her worth more than all the world beside, who have made up our minds to do our work ungrudgingly, asking for no reward beyond the results which spring up from our labor, we will spread the gospel of free thought among men until the sad minor melodies of Christianity have sobbed out their last mournful notes on the dying evening breeze. And on the fresh morning, winds shall ring out the chorus of hope and joyfulness from the glad lips of men whom the truth has at last set free. The intellectual comprehension of the sources of evil and the method of its extinction was a second great plank in my ethical platform. The study of Darwin and Herbert Spencer, of Huxley, Buchner and, and Haeckel, had not only convinced me of the truth of evolution, but with help from W. H. Clifford, Lubbock, Buckle, Lecky, and many another, had led me to see in the evolution of the social instinct the explanation of the growth of conscience and of the strengthening of man's mental and moral nature. If man by study of the conditions surrounding him and by the application of intelligence to the subdual of external nature had already accomplished so much, why should not further persistence along the same road lead to his complete emancipation? All the evil antisocial side of his nature was an inheritance from his brute ancestry and could be gradually eradicated. He could not only let the ape and tiger die, but he could kill them out. It may be frankly acknowledged that man inherits from his brute progenitors various bestial tendencies which are in course of elimination. The wild beast desire to fight is one of these, and this has been encouraged, not checked, by religion. Another bestial tendency is the lust of the male for the female apart from love, duty, and loyalty. This again has been encouraged by religion, as witness the polygamy and concubinage of the Hebrews, as in Abraham, David, and Solomon, not to mention the precepts of the Mosaic laws, the bands of male and female prostitutes in connection with the pagan temples, and the curious outbursts of sexual passion in connection with religious revivals and missions. Another bestial tendency is greed, the strongest grabbing all he can and trampling down the weak in the mad struggle for wealth. How and when has religion modified this tendency, sanctified as it is in our present civilization. All these bestial tendencies will be eradicated only by the recognition of human duty, of the social bond. Religion has not eradicated them, but science, by tracing them to their source in our brute ancestry, has explained them and has shown them in their true light. As each recognizes that the antisocial tendencies are the bestial tendencies in man, and that man in evolving further must evolve out of these, each also feels it part of his personal duty to curb these in himself, and so to rise further from the brute. This rational cooperation with nature distinguishes the scientific from the religious person, and this constraining sense of obligation is becoming stronger and stronger in all those who, in losing faith in God, have gained hope for man. For this rational setting of oneself on the side of the forces working for evolution implied active cooperation by personal purity and nobility. To the atheist it seems that the knowledge that the perfecting of the race is only possible by the improvement of the individual supplies the most constraining motive which can be imagined for efforts after personal perfection. The theist may desire personal perfection, but his desire is self-centered. Each righteous individual is righteous, as it were, alone, and his righteousness does not benefit his fellows, save as it may make him helpful and loving in his dealings with them. The atheist desires personal perfection, not only for his joy in it as beautiful in itself, but because science has taught him the unity of the race, and he knows that each fresh conquest of his over the baser parts of his nature, and each strengthening of the higher, is a gain for all and not for himself alone. Besides all this, the struggle against evil, regarded as transitory and as a necessary concomitant of evolution, loses its bitterness. In dealing with evil, atheism is full of hope instead of despair. To the Christian, evil is as everlasting as good. It exists by the permission of God, and therefore by the will of God. 
Our nature is corrupt, inclined to evil. The devil is ever near us, working all sin and all misery. What hope has the Christian face to face with the world's wickedness? What answer to the question, whence comes sin? To the atheist, the terrible problem has in it no figure of despair. Evil comes from ignorance, we say. Ignorance of physical and of moral facts. Primarily from ignorance of physical order. Parents who dwell in filthy, unventilated, unweathertight houses, who live on insufficient, innutritious, unwholesome food, will necessarily be unhealthy, will lack vitality, will probably have disease looking in their veins, such parents will bring into the world ill-nurtured children, in whom the brain will generally be the least developed part of the body. Such children, by their very formation, will incline to the animal rather than to the human, and by leading an animal or natural life will be deficient in those qualities which are necessary in social life. Their surroundings as they grow up, the home, the food, the associates, all are bad. They are trained into vice educated into criminality. So surely as from the sown corn rises the wheat ear, so from the sowing of misery, filth, and starvation shall arise crime. And the root of all is poverty and ignorance. Educate the children and give them fair wage for fair work in their maturity, and crime will gradually diminish and ultimately disappear. Man is God-made, says theism, Man is circumstance made, says atheism. Man is the resultant of what his parents were, of what his surroundings have been and are, and of what they have made him. Himself, the result of the past, he modifies the actual, and so the action and reaction go on. He himself, the effect of what is past, and one of the causes of what is to come. Make the circumstances good and the results will be good. For healthy bodies and healthy brains may be built up, and from a state composed of such the disease of crime will have disappeared. Thus is our work full of hope. No terrible will of God have we to struggle against, no despairful future to look forward to of a world growing more and more evil, until it is at last to be burned up, but a glad, fair future of an ever-rising race, where more equal laws, more general education, more just division, shall eradicate pauperism, destroy ignorance, nourish independence, a future to be made the grander by our struggles, a future to be made the nearer by our toil. This joyous, self-reliant facing of the world with the resolute determination to improve it is characteristic of the noblest atheism of our day, and it is thus a distinctly elevating factor in the midst of the selfishness, luxury, and greed of modern civilization. It is a virile virtue in the midst of the calculating and slothful spirit which too often veils itself under the pretense of religion. It will have no putting off of justice to a far-off day of reckoning, and it is ever spurred on by the feeling, The night cometh when no man can work. Bereft of all hope of a personal future, it binds up its hopes with that of the race, unbelieving in any aid from deity. It struggles the more strenuously to work out man's salvation by his own strength. To us there is but small comfort in Miss Cobb's assurance that the earth's wrongs and agonies will be righted hereafter. Granting for a moment that man survives death, what certainty have we that the next world will be any improvement on this? Miss Cobb assures us that this is God's world, whose world will the next be, if not also his. Will he be stronger there or better? that he should set right in that world the wrongs he has permitted here? Will he have changed his mind, or have become weary of the contemplation of suffering? To me the thought that the world was in the hands of a God who permitted all the present wrongs and pains to exist would be intolerable, maddening in its hopelessness. There is every hope of righting earth's wrongs and of curing earth's pains if the reason and skill of man which have already done so much are free to do the rest. But if they are to strive against omnipotence, hopeless indeed is the future of the world. It is in this sense that the atheist looks on good as the final goal of ill. And believing that that goal will be reached the sooner the more strenuous the efforts of each individual, he works in the glad certainty that he is aiding the world's progress thitherward. 
not dreaming of a personal reward hereafter, not craving a personal payment from heavenly treasury. He works and loves, content that he is building a future fairer than his present, joyous that he is creating a new earth for a happier race. Such was the creed and such the morality which governed my life and thoughts from 1874 to 1886, and with some misgivings to 1889, and from which I drew strength and happiness amid all outer struggles and distress. And I shall ever remain grateful for the intellectual and moral training it gave me, for the self-reliance it nurtured, for the altruism it inculcated, for the deep feeling of the unity of man that it fostered, for the inspiration to work that it lent. And perhaps the chief debt of gratitude I owe to free thought is that it left the mind ever open to new truth, encouraged the most unshrinking questioning of nature, and shrank from no new conclusions, however adverse to the old, that were based on solid evidence. I admit sorrowfully that all freethinkers do not learn this lesson, but I worked side by side with Charles Bradlaugh, and the free thought we strove to spread was strong-headed and broad-hearted. The antagonism, which, as we shall see in a few moments, blazed out against me from the commencement of my platform work, was based partly on ignorance, was partly aroused by my direct attacks on Christianity, and by the combative spirit I myself showed in those attacks, and very largely by my extreme radicalism in politics. I had against me all the conventional beliefs and traditions of society in general, and I attacked them, not with bated breath and abundant apologies, but joyously and defiantly, with sheer delight in the intellectual strife. I was fired, too, with passionate sympathy for the sufferings of the poor, for the overburdened, overdriven masses of the people, not only here but in every land, and wherever a blow was struck at liberty or justice, my pen or tongue break the silence. It was a perpetual carrying of the fiery cross, and the comfortable did not thank me for shaking them out of their soft repose. The antagonism that grew out of ignorance regarding atheism as implying degraded morality and bestial life, and they assailed my conduct not on evidence that it was evil, but on the presumption that an atheist must be immoral. Thus a Christian opponent at Leicester assailed me as a teacher of free love, fathering on me views which were maintained in a book I had not read, but which, before I had ever seen the National Reformer, had been reviewed in its columns, as it was reviewed in other London papers, and had been commended for its clear statement of the Malthusian position, but not for its contention as to free love, a theory to which Mr. Bradlaugh was very strongly opposed. Nor were the attacks confined to the ascription to me of theories which I did not hold, but agents of the Christian Evidence Society, in their street preaching, made the foulest accusations against me of personal immorality. Remonstrances addressed to the Rev. Mr. Engstrom, the secretary of the Society, brought voluble protestations of disavowal and disapproval. But as the peccant agents were continued in their employment, the apologies were of small value. No accusation was too coarse, no slander too baseless, for circulation by these men, and for a long time these indignities caused me bitter suffering, outraging my pride and soiling my good name. The time was to come when I should throw that good name to the winds for the sake of the miserable, but in those early days I had done nothing to merit, even ostensibly, such attacks. Even by educated writers, those sh who should have known better, the most wanton accusations of violence and would-be destructiveness were brought against atheists. Thus Miss Frances Power Cobb wrote in a contemporary review that Loss of faith in God would bring about the secularization or destruction of all cathedrals, churches, and chapels. Why, I wrote in answer, should cathedrals, churches, and chapels be destroyed? Atheism will utilize, not destroy, the beautiful edifices which, once wasted on God, shall hereafter be consecrated for man. Destroy Westminster Abbey, with its exquisite arches, its glorious tones of soft, rich color, its stonework light as if of cloud, its dreamy, subdued twilight, soothing as the shadow of a great rock in a weary land? Nay, but reconsecrated to humanity, 
the fat cherubs who tumble over guns and banners on soldiers' graves will fitly be removed to some spot where their clumsy forms will no longer mar the upward-springing grace of lines of pillar and of arch. But the glorious building wherein now barbaric psalms are chanted and droning canons preach of eastern follies shall hereafter echo the majestic music of Wagner and Beethoven, and the teachers of the future shall there unveil to thronging multitudes the beauties and the wonders of the world. The towers and spires will not be effaced, but they will no longer be symbols of a religion which sacrifices earth to heaven and man to God. Between the cultured and the uncultured burlesques of atheism we came off pretty badly, being for the most part regarded, as the late Cardinal Manning termed us, as mere cattle. The moral purity and elevation of atheistic teaching were overlooked by many who heard only of my bitter attacks on Christian theology. Against the teachings of eternal torture, of the vicarious atonement, of the infallibility of the Bible, I leveled all the strength of my brain and tongue, and as I exposed the history of the Christian church with unsparing hand, its persecutions, its religious wars, its cruelties, its oppressions, smarting under the suffering inflicted on myself, and wroth with the cruel pressure continually put on freethinkers by Christian employers, speaking under constant threats of prosecution, identifying Christianity with the political and social tyrannies of Christendom, I used every weapon that history, science, criticism, scholarship could give me against the churches. Eloquence, sarcasm, mockery, all were called on to make breaches in the wall of traditional belief and crass superstition. To argument and reason I was ever ready to listen, but I turned a front of stubborn defiance to all attempts to compel assent to Christianity by appeals to force. The threat and the enforcement of legal and social penalties against unbelief can never compel belief. Belief must be gained by demonstration. It can never be forced by punishment. Persecution makes the stronger among us bitter, the weaker among us hypocrites. It never has made and never can make an honest convert. That men and women are now able to speak and think as openly as they do, that a broader spirit is visible in the churches, that heresy is no longer regarded as morally disgraceful, these things are very largely due to the active and militant propaganda carried on under the leadership of Charles Bradlaugh, whose nearest and most trusted friend I was. That my tongue was in the early days bitterer than it should have been, I frankly acknowledge. That I ignored the services done by Christianity and threw light only on its crimes, thus committing injustice, I am ready to admit. But these faults were conquered long ere I left the atheistic camp and they were the faults of my personality, not of the atheistic philosophy. And my main contentions were true, and needed to be made. From many a Christian pulpit today may be heard the echo of the free-thought teachings. Men's minds have been awakened, their knowledge enlarged. And while I condemn the unnecessary harshness of some of my language, I rejoice that I played my part in that educating of England which has made impossible forevermore the crude superstitions of the past, and the repetition of the cruelties and injustices under which preceding heretics suffered. But my extreme political views had also much to do with the general feeling of hatred with which I was regarded. Politics, as such, I cared not for at all, for the necessary compromises of political life were intolerable to me. But wherever they touched on the life of the people, they became to me of burning interest. The land question, the incidence of taxation, the cost of royalty, the obstructive power of the House of Lords. These were the matters to which I put my hand. I was a home ruler, too, of course, and a passionate opponent of all injustice to nations weaker than ourselves, so that I found myself always in opposition to the government of the day. Against our aggressive and oppressive policy in Ireland, in the Transvaal, in India, in Afghanistan, in Burma, in Egypt, I lifted up my voice in all our great towns, trying to touch the consciences of the people, and to make them feel the immorality of a land-stealing, piratical policy. Against war, against capital punishment, against flogging, demanding national education instead of big guns, public libraries instead of warships. No wonder I was denounced as an agitator, a firebrand, 
and that all orthodox society turned up at me its most respectable nose. End of chapter 7